he started, if I can say, correct me if I'm wrong, Woo! as the rhythm guitar in John and I Riders. Back in the days, back in the 80s, early 80s. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> and you know, on those, on those years, people like John Blair and this guy over here, Paul Johnson, revitalized surf music. I don't know for how long, because it went down again in the 80s, probably nobody uh, did care much about, about that, apart from very few bands. Uh, and then in the beginning of the 90s, it exploded again, arriving to Pulp Fiction, 94, a lot of bands, thousands of surf bands in Europe, everywhere, and then in the early 2000s, the movement went a bit down again. Now I think it's very strong. We even have North Sea Surf Radio. So, I mean, looking at the listeners to the radio, I would say that the surf music uh, movement is quite active and strong, and I'm very happy about that. But after this experience in the middle 90s, um, this guy and Dusty Watson, both of them part of John and Night Riders in the beginning, uh, started up a band called Slackton. And I would say that this gentleman over here uh, create, I mean, for what I see, for how, the way I see it, a new way of playing surf music. Yeah. He's doing things that I can't say nobody's able to do. That's the point. <laughs> He's like that. Well, with his beautiful guitar, of course, he always has beautiful guitars. That's another point of Dave Bronsky here. <laughs> and every time on the Surf Guitar 101 forum, and everybody's always asking, what is he using? What are his pedals? I need to see what is his setup. How can I get that sound? Well, let's try to see if we can steal a little bit of Dave Bronsky's secrets. <laughs> Dave Bronsky. Maybe I should just walk off now and then everything will be, be good so I don't mess it up. But um, yeah, well, listening to Paul and the other guys uh, made me reflect upon, you know, like what made me play guitar in the first place when I was a little kid. And it was a kid across the street's father had an Adventures album. And I heard that. And I don't know, there was something about it that was really, really cool, you know, because it was, it was so simple. I was already a big fan of the radio. I lived outside of Washington, D.C., and they have very good radio there. And listening to R&B and, uh, and rock, you know, just on whatever came on the hit radio. So that's what made me want to play guitar. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up being in, you know, various bands. I mean, when I graduated from high school, the next day I went to Chicago from where I lived by L.A. to join a band, and I was in rock bands trying to be you know, the greatest rock guitar player that I could be, and dabbling in a lot of other types of music as well. And, uh, but I always, you know, the Beach Boys were very special to me when I was a kid. And the instrumentals and all that, I just heard it as one thing. It was just, and it was the feeling of it. And these guys talking, Paul and them, made me think about the transition in recorded music and records. It kind of went from, in the old days, it was like, it was a good song. I, I like the lyrics and I can sing along and I can dance to it, you know, and the recording was just a performance of the band playing a song that we like. We like to dance to it or whatever. Then there seemed to be a trend to start where the music was, or the records, the way they were recorded, it would be like, it sounds like, and being like it represents something rather than it's just a performance. And uh, I guess Link Ray's record, Rumble, was very influential to, to people back then. They probably didn't even know why. A lot of them knew why. That record got banned throughout much of the United States, and it was an instrumental. <laughs> so how could, like, three chords be that subversive that we have to ban it? Because that song sounded like somebody throwing a guitar against the wall. <laughs> sounds like. That just sounds like something just breaking, you know, like the buildings coming down, you know, it wasn't, it was just such a, I think it was the beginning of the transition that happened, you know, in movie soundtrack work with like Ennio Morricone, he was probably, not even the people that he influenced probably didn't realize at the time, but the music in a movie has to represent and help to draw you into the story, or draw you, make you feel what you're seeing up there. And so, 
and then and then I and music went on from then to be about ideas and things, you know, with with Bob Dylan and later the Beatles and different people and rather than how much is that doggy in the window, we, you know, the lyrics were now suggesting things that were beyond just our experience in here at a dance party. So, you know that, you know, went through all that as a kid growing up, you know, I'm playing in rock bands and um, the bass player of John and the Night Riders, the Nikki Six dude, that the guy in Molly Cruz stole his name, by the way, had another three hours on that subject. Um, <coughs> I was a great fan of his. I used to watch his band play all the time. I always wanted to be in a band with him. So he wanted to know if I wanted to go in the studio and record some surf music with John Blair and Dusty. So yeah, definitely, you know, because that's what made me want to play guitar in the first place. So long story short, like it's too late for that, I guess. Um, so I did that because, you know, I like that music and, and whatever, even though Jeff and I were, were, were in real serious bands at the time where we were, you know, really trying to crack the nut of, you know, being the next big deal in the rock bands. Um, I ne it never even crossed my mind at that time, this was like 1980, that you could even play that type of music in a, cl in a club, in a bar. It never even, I mean, literally, I'm telling you the truth, it never even occurred to me, oh yeah, we could go play in some bar somewhere. It never even occurred to me, it was just, it didn't cross my mind, it was too odd of an idea. So like two weeks after me going into this little studio and recording that, John gets a call that they want us to open for the surf punks at the Santa Monica Civic with Dick Dale with second bill and it sold out 3,300 people. And I was there. You were there? Oh. <laughs> Sorry about the hearing. <laughs> but leading up to that, um, the Surf Beat 80 record was already out. I wasn't on that. And it's real kind of a docile sounding nice album, you know? So we got this offer to play there, and I was like, that doesn't even make sense to me, but okay. I was reading up about the surf punks opening bands, what happened to them, and they opened for them. They get spit off the stage and pulled off and beat up, you know? I go, well, between, I don't know about, you know, but between me and Jeff and Dusty Watson, we're gonna drive this stuff down our throat so hard they're not even gonna know what hit them, you know? And we're gonna play like two minute songs, and we're just gonna, Pounded hard, and that's what we did. And then to get the attitude up, where you know, try to take this on, you know, like it's like an adversarial thing. It's, there's no way I was going to go off that stage anywhere, but you know, with the with the flag in hand. <laughs> so, so that was cool. Um, but anyway, so you know, John and the Night Riders, uh, we came to Europe for the first first surf instrumental band to ever come to Europe in 1981. It was literally, I think. A, to the day of our first gig, one year that we came over here. And we did come to Italy, we played in Milano, we had some shows, we, and John and I did like about five radio interviews. It was really interesting, but it was definitely not what anybody was thinking about when we came here, but it was interesting, you know. And uh, so, out of time? No, 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 you got all the time you want, but you mentioned John and I Riders, 1981. I got the proof over here. Yeah. John and Night Riders live in Eindhoven, Holland. The, the 3rd of October, 1981. <laughs> yeah, that was a memorable gig. That was a rockabilly show. It was a rock and roll meeting in Eindhoven, which they've been doing for 100 years, I think. And uh, this was pretty much the last thing they were on here. At that, on that tour, we had Greg Eckler was playing drums, and he was playing standing up. So we had, we were in the front, like, with ten soldiers right at the front of the stage. Just like, here it comes, you know, and that was, <laughs> that was something else. So, the John and I writers thing kind of wound down in the early 80s, and, uh, you know, I went back to playing in a bunch of different rock bands and all that, and uh, some good ones. Came over here to Europe a few times with rock bands, and, uh, so back in the middle 90s, I, you know, I had all these songs I, that I had written back in the John and the Night Riders uh, era that we were playing live shows, but they never ended up on any records. And I always had this idea of what I thought this, this uh, kind of music, this approach to be relevant and new. And I, I thought there was not that many surf instrumentals that I liked in the old days that were great. And that was my goal. I liked 
the, the formula of like a walk, don't run by the Ventures, their version of it. Paul's songs, this condensed short little format with, with you know, jamming on the guitar, you know, all that stuff that came later in the 60s with all these jam bands thinking they're all jazz musicians or something. But it's just this simple little collection of notes with a simple little arrangement that if you're gonna have a party and guitar players over and whatever, people wanna play that and everybody's gonna find something in that that they like. And what is it about those little instrumentals like that that make them like that? What's so good about them compared to something else? And that's what I've been trying to figure out to this day. And you know, when I think I'm somewhat successful, I, I think like maybe if I could just add to that short list of the old instrumentals that are really cool to play with guys that you've never played with before, party situation, hey, let's get a party going here, rather than making people just leave, you know, and finding out what it is, just little riffs that they can sit with you right away. So, this Slack Tone started, I had about eight of these songs, you know, ready to roll, and we went in the studio. We had two rehearsals, Lee and Dusty and Mike Sullivan, and uh, we went in a beautiful studio in Hollywood, and, uh, Dusty one take to like six of them in a row. Bam, 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 like that, of the first Slack Tone album. One right after another. You know, Dusty had the connection to this studio. It was a very good studio with gold records on the wall and everything. And you know, he had recorded there with some rock band and, and the guy liked him, that owned it. So he says, yeah, come on down. He thought we were just gonna mess around playing. Yeah, we're gonna play some surf music. Ah, oh, yeah, come on down. And gave us this, you know, a cheap rate and uh, thought we were just gonna just screw around. But we weren't screwing around. <laughs> We came in there and Dusty pounded those out. And there, at one time, because I, I was playing in the control room, just doing scratch tracks, and the engineer goes, what's going on here? And I go, we're recording, dude. <laughs> and he's going, okay. So it was, that's how that all began. And, um, and um, so anyway, in a three-piece format, uh, you know, I had to find ways uh, to, make it sound like it's in my head and I gotta be able to do it in front of you, you know? And, if, and so I, I came up with these different ways of representing the music and playing over the top of it, any trick I could come up with. You know, I, I do, um, I have a technique that I do where, to make it sound like a 12 string, like that, is kind of like, you know, I'm an amateur Chet Atkins fan, you know, and uh, so I steal from any of those people I can, but I thought I'd really love the way 12 strings sound, but I would never change guitars and have a 12 string and put it, I just, you know, you gotta, you gotta make it work itself. So jazz guitar players, they, they don't play pinches like two strings, but it's always harmony. It's always harmony stuff, and I like the sound of a 12 string, so I figured out a way to get that sound within everything else I'm playing. echo as well you know that's another thing that you know you can fake a lot of cool stuff like you I, I, I liken it to you know like a skim board you ever seen that where the waves come in on the, and they throw it down you know right where the water's real thin they'll throw it down and then ride okay well I kind of do the same thing with the guitar with it using a little bit of an echo plex usually and uh, like a And then I'm gonna ride it, you know, with a melody on top of that. I mean, you visualize it like that, and it kind of get, you know, that's the way my stupid brain works anyway. But, uh, so, uh, I think Martin mentioned as well, or maybe it was Paul. I can't remember, but you know, using chords and then playing melodies within the chord and pulling stuff out of it, so you can kind of. Sound like two guys, and maybe even three if you get some other trickery going with a little echo thrown under, then you change while that's still going down, you know. Like, a, like I do in Mysterioso or. Do a lot of these pinches in my melodies. 